This podcast is brought to you in part by Sing and Dog Double Read Supply. Sing and Dog Double Reads is an online double read shop and one of the largest suppliers of high quality and affordable professional and student reads for oboe and bassoon in the USA. Please visit www.singandog.com to see all of their products. That's S-I-N-G-I-N-D-O-G dot com. Dedicated to providing excellent handmade oboe and bassoon reeds to discriminating double reed players of all ages and abilities, Double or Nothing Reeds has recently expanded to sell double reed tools and supplies, gift items, and more. This includes knives, knife blades, thread, staples, cane, bags, and resources for students. As authorized Fox and Yamaha dealers, they offer an extensive range of oboes and bassoons for all levels. In addition, they sell quality used instruments on consignment. If you're looking for private oboe lessons but can't find anyone nearby, Double or Nothing Reads offers oboe lessons via Skype. Visit doubleornothingreads.com for good quality and affordable readmaking supplies and accessories, lessons, instruments, and much more. That's doubleornothingreads.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson, and you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. From WBZ Chicago, this is Ira Glass, and this is This American Life. <laughs> I don't know if that was very Ira, <laughs> how I just spoke. Oh, well. We got new mics, y'all. Woo-hoo! <laughs> we are no longer going to sound like we're crackling at each other from 5,000 miles away. Now, to be fair... Between the two of us, we have six degrees, but none of them are in tech, podcasting, <laughs> computering, sound. So we've been figuring it out as we went along. And thanks uh-huh. to the generosity of our sponsors and their support, we were able to upgrade our equipment. So we hope a it's sadly needed upgrade. Yes. Booyah. <laughs> Hopefully it sounds crystal clear and wonderful. Hopefully there's no skeptical listener going, it still sounds bad. <laughs> and that was like those like podcast intros were literally the first things that we did <laughs> when we got the new microphones. Yes, we I definitely like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm <laughs> spent some time playing Terry and Ira back and forth, probably longer <laughs> than we should admit. That's a little embarrassing. <laughs> still fun though, it still works. So how are you? I'm doing great. It is summer break. I am knee deep in personal projects and it is so awesome. How are you doing? Pretty much the same except Missouri is as humid as a greenhouse right now. My hair is sad, (laughs) mad, frizzy, fried, large. It's all of those (laughs) things. So uh, yes, as as long as this is audio only, I'm doing great. Don't look at me. I'm hideous. So for our dish today, we were thinking of sharing our most memorable listening experiences from our childhood or young adulthood. Do you want to start, Jackie? Sure. Uh, When you brought up this topic, the first thing that came to mind um, was actually a listening experience in my undergrad. As I talked about on the podcast before, um, I kind of got into the bassoon and being serious about classical music a little bit later. Um, So I funded my undergraduate study by being a live-in nanny, actually, for my uh, bassoon teacher and her husband, uh, both of whom were principals in the Spokane Symphony Orchestra. Shout out to John Marshall and Lynn Feller Marshall. Uh, so they had nighttime rehearsals and they needed child care, and uh, that's how I funded my undergrad. Uh, but they were really cool about encouraging me to go to concerts and uh, letting me have the night off so I could attend Spokane Symphony concerts. 
And I remember her saying, the next Classics concert, it's really important you go to. And I actually was on tour with the University Wind Ensemble. I said, ah, I can't go. And she said, okay, well, it's really important you hear this piece, so I'm going to see if I can get you into the dress rehearsal. Um, and because I had no, you know, classical pedigree or anything, I didn't understand the significance of her telling me this piece she wanted me to hear so bad was Mahler 9. And I'd never heard Mahler before. We hadn't gotten to him in music history at that point yet. And so she says, great news. The music director said, you can come to the dress rehearsal. You'll come with us, and um, you'll just sit quietly in the audience. And their dress rehearsals were just pretty much run-throughs, you know. So it was like being at a performance. And there were a couple other people there, um, I think a couple board members and the assistant conductor, but they sat behind me in the opera house. So I was there in the Spokane Opera House, um, kind of midway through the floor seating and not knowing at all what was in store. I had not studied the work. I didn't know at all. Um, and so that was how I experienced my first Mahler symphony. All, it was basically like a private performance for me. Um, and even more significant, I had just experienced a pretty substantial personal loss at that time in the death of a close friend. And it was really cool in retrospect now knowing a lot about Mahler 9, how the music translated everything I needed it, uh, everything it was saying I got musically. Right. I didn't need program notes. I didn't need um, a history book. I heard everything Mahler was talking about, and it felt like the music was talking to me personally, not to be too mushy, mushy. Mm -hmm. um, but it was uh, so amazing. And I just sat there and tears streaming down my face during that last movement. Uh, just feeling this moment of catharsis and so overwhelmed by that music is overwhelming, period. But, you know, being a young person, falling in love with the Western canon and experiencing this personal loss, it was just I've never forgotten uh, that performance and being an audience member. And it was just phenomenal. And, uh, yeah, it was amazing. What about you? Oh, that's so cool. I have a couple. Um, my dad, so growing up, my dad is a musician. Um, he's a violinist. And I remember, you know, I started out with the violin and then I played the clarinet and I kind of got a little bored with the clarinet. So I told my dad I wanted to play the double bass. And he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fine, I guess I'll keep playing clarinet. And, uh, he took me to a Hartford Symphony concert at the Bushnell, um, and I don't remember what was being played. I must have been 11 years old or 12 years old, but I remember there was an oboe solo, and I had never heard an oboe before, or maybe I had, but I hadn't really paid attention to it, and I don't remember what piece it was, but I remember turning to my dad after the solo and being like, I don't know what that is, but I want it. So that was actually the reason that I started playing the oboe in the first place, which ended up being a very significant um, move in, you know, how my whole life has turned out. And um, my parents were really involved in their synagogue growing up. And um, for um, as part of the Yom Kippur Jewish holiday, um, the night before is the Kol Nidre service, which is like a really beautiful, sad um service uh, of, you know, repentance and remembrance. And my dad every year would play the violin for this service. And um, he had this little room in our tiny, tiny old built in 1912 house in Connecticut that was like off of the bathroom. And he had it for like all his music stuff and his like audio editing and video editing stuff. And, you know, of course, I'm like an, a young, annoying child, and I'm like, what you doing? Can I see? Can I come in? Can I see? What are you doing? What are you doing? And, of course, he would be like, go away. <laughs> Wait outside. So he's in there writing the music that he's going to play for the Kol Nidre service, and I'm sitting outside the door 
in the bathroom, oh. like sitting outside the door and listening to him compose this gorgeous melody, um, which I still remember. I think he's written it down at some point, but if I heard it, I would remember it. Um, and that was just, I remember just being transfixed, just sitting outside the door and listening to him practice. And like, I think that, I think it really did form who I am, you know, in terms of like, because, you know, what eight, nine year old kid sits outside of <laughs> a door <laughs> listening to their parent play the violin. But it was just so beautiful. And I just remember being inspired by it. And um, it really changed which path I went on in the future. So that was really cool. Thanks, Dad. No kidding. <laughs> I was just thinking, oh, it. At nine years old, Glee is listening to her dad compose beautiful Jewish melodies, and I'm across the country in Washington State going, Hanson! Ooh! <laughs> Mbop! It really didn't improve my chances of fitting in in school, but... <laughs> Nor did my Hanson obsession, for the record. <laughs> Hanson was really big there for a while, Jackie. It's true. It's true. Probably still is in some circles who's to judge. But I still prefer Franklin Countitz, so. Shout out to Franklin Countitz. Yay. <laughs> so last episode, Galit was the slacker and forgot to do her shout out. And this episode... I am the slacker and forgot to do a <laughs> shout out. So we will both be better and on our best behavior for episode 14. But please <laughs> let's your shout out. Well, my shout out is a YouTube channel by our last oboe guest, Eugene Isatov. It's if you search on YouTube, oboe solo, he has a bunch of videos of him teaching excerpts. And it's so good. There are lengthy explanations and demonstrations of what he's talking about. Um, he has posted um, performances that he's done, recordings that he's done, um, master classes that he's done. Um, you can actually watch him give a master class. If you were really buying what he was selling in the last episode, you can get more of it on his YouTube page. And I was watching um, some of his um, excerpt teaching videos and was like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> and then, of course, his playing is, you know, like you, I, I don't know about you, Jackie, but I feel like, you know, I'll be bopping along feeling like I'm doing just fine. And then I'll listen to a recording that Eugene has put out and I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> fail. <laughs> oh, that's what it's supposed to sound like. Never mind. <laughs> No, I actually love his videos, too, and for our bassoon listeners, I think this is very applicable. He does a lot of the excerpts that we have in common, Scheherazade, Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, um, that type of thing. Uh, but also on a personal note, you know, in my position at SEMO, I have to do a lot of double duty, and we'll do double reads together for studio class or whatnot, and so a lot of times, I, we all, oboists and bassoonists alike, are subjected to someone thinking it's a good idea to put us all together and have one person teach all of us, you know? <laughs> and so I've been able to, in watching him talk about and teach these excerpts, uh, come up with some, you know, more sophisticated things to say when I'm teaching both oboe and bassoon, because that's a really hard line to straddle. So I think it's a good, great tool for bassoonists as well. Yeah, and he just sounds so great. And it's really cool that he's reaching out um, via the internet, because no matter where you live, you have access to Great Plain. Genda Industries is making the reed knife great again with the student reed knife by Genda. Genda Industries is known for its amazing quality and service in the double reed world, and in a world where the term student quality associates with cheap and disposable, Genda Industries is winning by making the best student reed knife ever. The student reed knife features a tapered handle that will fit any size hand as you grow, a high quality stainless steel blade that won't rust, it's actually sharpened and ready for use out of the box, is designed to be used when learning how to sharpen, and most importantly, 
importantly, since it is a gender read knife, it is 100% supported by Genda. Plain and simple, the student read knife by Genda is the knife you'll want to use as you start your read making and adjusting journey. Add the code DRDGENDA, all capital letters, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda read knife, maintenance kit, read knife sharpening book, cutting block, and read tool roll. Visit them at gendaindustries.com. Oh, and they're a lot more than just reed knives. The Southern Oboe Intensive provides a distinctive opportunity for oboists to spend five days immersed in world-class instruction. The Intensive draws students from middle school through college graduates from throughout the United States. During the Intensive, students at all levels are coached by James Sullivan of the Alabama Symphony, Russ DeLuna of the San Francisco Symphony, and Phil Ross of the St. Louis Symphony. Not only are these gentlemen exceptional oboists, but each brings extraordinary and unique experience and perspective to share with the participants. An additional one-of-a-kind benefit of the intensive is a recital performed by Mr. Sullivan, Mr. DeLuna, and Mr. Ross. Students will be instantly inspired by the level of artistry, collegialism, and joy evoked when these three superb musicians collaborate. Visit southernoboeintensive.com for more information and to register. That's southernoboeintensive.com. I am so pleased to welcome bassoonist Nadina Mackie Jackson to the podcast. Welcome, Nadina. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you so much, Billy. I'm really happy to be here. How about we start off by uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself, um, how you got to where you are today, and your training and educational journey. Thank you. Yeah, I like talking about it. It's it's nice from my vantage point. It's so long ago, but the more you talk about it, the shorter it gets. So I began in the far north of British Columbia. I was the daughter of ranchers and actually freelance writers, a very strange combination. And we lived completely off the grid. And that's a history in itself. But at one point, my parents felt that perhaps we children should be near other human beings. <laughs> and we, we moved to the coast. And and uh, so I had a really idyllic childhood going between the mountain ranch and, and the coast. My father was a forest ranger. We weren't wealthy, but I didn't know that. We had horses, and it was a great childhood. And... In my teens, my parents established a log building school in a different part of northern British Columbia. And again, we were completely off the grid. And it happened to coincide with a time when instruments were being purchased. Um, Canada's a little bit behind the U.S. in these matters, so there were not instruments in the small town where I was. It's now a fairly big town, but they got a bassoon, and I heard someone play it, but we there weren't any immediately available. I had to wait another year. So it was I was probably 14 by the time I got an instrument. But I was I loved the bassoon and I would fly down from Prince George to Vancouver once a month and there was only one airplane leaving and one returning the next the same one returned the next day. So I'd fly down, have a lesson with this really bitter man who was then the principal bassoon of the Vancouver Symphony. I won't name him, but <laughs> a couple of guys ago and I loved the lessons I only know now that they were they were kind of harsh and then I would go have dinner and sleep in the airport and the police would wake me up once in a while um, just to make sure I wasn't a runaway but you know I had my head on my bassoon case and I had a pretty good story so that I was never a problem and then the curious thing about that was uh, in 2009 when I was touring BC I told that story from the stage and the pilot was in the audience, so that was fun. Yeah, he didn't. He wasn't even that old, so he must have been like I would have been 14, and he must have been in his early 20s at the time that he was flying that that um, flight. So I then applied to university, uh, UBC, the University of British Columbia, and I got in when I was 16. And I had a gr by then there was a new bassoonist in the Vancouver Symphony, and that was Christopher Millard, and he was very young. Uh, he was exactly six years older than me. We were born on the same day. And I was the only bassoon student, so I had six-hour lessons. Wow. And, yeah. It At was, a time? Yeah. City? Yeah, because he had just started with the symphony, and, I mean, he's 22. He was a bassoon keener then. 
and and a very generous person. I mean, most of us are way too busy for anything like that to ever happen. And it would be like playing and then reads and then playing. So it was like having my own kind of sabbatical at the very beginning of my uh, learning period. And then in my second year, well, <laughs> the downside possibly was that I stopped going to classes. Um, I practiced all the time. And I think at that age I didn't really have the skills. I'd always gone ahead in school really quickly, so I didn't really have the interest in pursuing things that, uh, frankly, are very interesting to me now, but they were new to me then, um, the structures of, of theory and history that was less interesting to me at the time. So I just practiced very hard. I felt I had to do that to catch up, and I was probably right about that. And so in the middle of my second year at the university, I applied to Curtis and I was lucky enough to get in. They accepted three bassoon players that year. Um, all of us went on to get jobs, but and all of us were from Canada that year, which is really strange, from different parts of Canada. So, and then I was had a, an amazingly intense four years there, studying first three years with Bernard Garfield, who was a wonderful teacher, incredibly efficient and, and disciplined read maker. And then I was lucky enough in my fourth year to study with Saul Schoenbach, who returned briefly and became a lifelong friend. And, of course, all the other wind teachers there. I had a headache the whole four years I was there because I don't know why, really. I guess I was trying so hard. And I was scared to death of John Delancey, the, the oboe teacher. And I knew he wouldn't physically harm me, but... He could just see into the depths of my reed soul and, and see every sin just by looking at me, right? There was no question. So, the, yeah, but it was worth it. And then before I graduated, I auditioned for the Mexico Symphony and the Montreal Symphony. Mexico was co-principal and, Mexico, and Montreal was second soon. And I got both of them at that time. It was 1981. And... When I talked to the personnel manager of the, I don't even know if I'm calling it by the right name, anyway, the Mexican orchestra, I said, you know, I just bought my first stereo. It was a stereo at that time. And I'd never had one because, like I say, we grew up off the grid. And I said, is that going to be easy to bring across the border? And he very casually said, well, you should probably just smuggle it and avoid the hassle. And I thought, yeah, you know what, I'm not ready for that. I'm going to go to Montreal. And Montreal was at the beginning of their intense decade of recording for London Decca and I really wanted to have that experience of doing just a lot of orchestral recordings and I'm glad I did so that was that was great I got to learn French instead of Spanish maybe the Spanish will come later so I think that's my training and and to speak of training it, it continues right it so it, I I learned enough to get into an orchestra and my teacher Bernard Garfield said to me when I was studying he said in fact, that's actually when you start to learn is when you get your first big job. Well, your career is so extensive and multifaceted, and I want to get in depth into that for sure. But before we move on from your student days, um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, because they are such legends, um, what were lessons with Saul Schoenbach and Bernard Garfield like? I, You know, we don't get to kind of peer Mm -hmm. into those uh, situations so much. So I, I'd love if you could talk to us about them a little bit. And can I just say that's such a great question because, uh, and you know, without me saying it, that that every individual is going to have a unique response to their teacher. And it obviously has to be a good teacher. But they were both amazing, very different. They, But the qualities that they shared that I think should be universal was they were incredibly confident teachers but they were both very humble um straight up front i think i don't remember which one i think it was mr garfield would say he said of course i'm a good teacher i have the best students in the world coming here how could i not be a good teacher and he said that's something to think about in every context and i i appreciated that he handed um the credit back to us as much as he accepted it and but they were both deeply kind um they were 
dedicated teachers, I should separate them. It's, it's, it's funny. To, my brain is trying to overlap them right now. So starting with Mr. Garfield, very efficient. He, he had a busy orchestral schedule at the time that I was studying with him, and our lessons were strictly an hour, but they were incredibly dense. He believed, he would show us technical routines, but he gave me a principle that I've taken to extremes, and I think it, it should be universal as well. He'd say any technical problem that you have in your repertoire can be turned into an exercise and put on the grid of, of scales of any kind and made into a routine. And then he shared his routines with me, which I did for many years because there's something so comforting about repeating your teacher's routines. You remember the warmth and the... Um, no, there's nothing like that beginning of your career where your aspirations are met with instruction. And, and, and so I did exactly what he showed me for a long time, but I felt... I had this empowerment button that I could push any time, and I did, and developed my own exercises. But I actually really activated that when four year la- years later I was in the symphony and would I'd hit up against uh, challenges that I hadn't foreseen. And so that really simple instruction helped a lot. And uh, they both memorized everything, their excerpts and, and relative passages. Saul Schoenbach... Um, he had a, they were physically different. Uh, Mr. Garfield was um, compact and quite short, kind of my height, and Saul is very tall. But he didn't use, Saul did not use his height to intimidate. He had a lofty kind of humor, and he would he would mock us, but not in a cruel way. And he would, in that way, activate our own initiative. Let me give an example. Um, sometimes, because he was. He was, I uh, guess, in his late 60s when I met him. I'd have to look it up. But he, he was spending time in Florida is what I'm trying to say. So sometimes he'd go down there for three weeks, and then he'd come back and give us five lessons in a row. And he expected us to be prepared. And it, and on the fifth day, I remember that I, I went into a lesson with Rick Granty, who's now in Boston. And we we neither of us were prepared for that fifth day, and we thought we would play double bassoon excerpts. <laughs> And it didn't go well. And Saul, <laughs> at one point, he just put his hands in his lap, and he looked at us, and he said, everybody wants to play the bassoon. He said, go home. <laughs> <laughs> and we were so humiliated. That was Those were the harshest words he ever spoke to us. And, um, and we, you know, we went and practiced hard. And I think it was reasonable of him to expect us to have be ready for five lessons in a row. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because in the classical world, the the unexpected is hitting you all the time. And he wasn't telling us exactly what to bring. He was expecting us to have a range of material ready without using those words, but clearly (laughs) in the proof. So I could go on and on about both of them. And later uh, I invited Saul to teach with me at Domaine Farché, and and that was wonderful to reconnect after I'd been away from him for um, probably 12 years at that point. And so I have beautiful photographs, but I think that the learning continues through this kind of discussion. So the work that you guys are doing, create, creating our, our oral history, as it were, is, is such a valuable thing. Um, and, and all his students will answer, obviously, differently. But I guess... Um, they also made me feel safe because they challenged me but gave me the tools at all times. And I came from such a different culture. They both had Jewish backgrounds, intensely cultured childhoods. And I came from the far north Canada bush, and we related instantly. There was something very wide, wide thinking about both of them in their different ways. So um, I would love to know, how it was to record with the uh, with Montreal. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like you did. I mean, you obviously have a lot of solo CDs. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the process is very different, but can you talk about like was it influenced? Did you yeah. did you want to do solo CDs because of your experience yeah. in Montreal? Yes, that's very insightful of you. It was definitely. Um, and it was an intense training experience. So in Montreal, the year I joined, we <laughs> we recorded the first thing I recorded with them. 
as second bassoon was the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto with Kim Wat Chung. And you guys know how the second movement opens. Oh, my God. <laughs> so we, I'm like 22 years old, and I have been making reads for six years at that point, if you count absolute. Well, maybe even a tiny bit longer. I learned at summer camp when I was 14. So, but it takes a long time to be a good read maker, especially if you have like really soft F sharps to play a second bassoon. And um, so we were recording all of those recordings with Montreal Symphony in that period were done in a, in a magnificent, gigantic Catholic church uh, at San Justash. And it was obviously no air conditioning. So, and we, and initially we were recording in the middle of summer because, I don't know why, maybe because we had fewer regular concerts, I don't know why, but we changed that quickly because it's just so brutal to record in, at maximum humidity and heat. The tuning is really hard. So that, that was a really scarring experience for me and I, it's, it's important to have those experiences that given a choice I would avoid them, but uh, we got through it and um, then the recording sessions got moved into the fall so that the acoustically it sounds better if the air is cold and if, as opposed to when the air is full of moisture. You'd have to ask an engineer why that is, but I've experienced it. And then the great thing about those sessions with London Decca was uh, they would they would put a big curtain across the altar area, a big velvet curtain to take down some of the echo. And then behind in the vestry where the Normally the minister or the priest is, they, they'd set up all their equipment, including these massive speakers for playback. So we would record and then we were completely welcome to go back in the booth with, there was enough room there and listen. And Dutrois would listen to every playback and I went to absolutely every playback. Some of the older players, uh, very few, but some of them wouldn't go. They, not because they were lazy, because they, some musicians find it upsetting to hear the playback but I found it essential to hear it because you know as, as you're sitting in the bassoon section playing in a great big orchestra and you don't know how it's mixing and for me the hard part about playing in an orchestra is strangely it's the soft stuff it's the quiet blending stuff and, you know the loud incisive solo stuff is just pure fun it's athletic fun and artistic fun but the Tremendously taxing stuff is to blend exquisitely. And those big speakers were so uh, crystal clear that you could hear. You could hear the tuning. You could hear the success. Uh, when we recorded um, Ravel Piano Concerto, uh, Richard Honig was the principal bassoonist, and he we opted to play it in unison. Just I find that trading off to be brutal. <laughs> uh, you know how it's written. But to, uh, and so... I remember the conductor Dutrois turning to the to our producer and saying, "Isn't it too loud with two bassoons?" And the producer said, "What? There's two bassoons?" <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, "Yeah, that's good." <laughs> so we, yeah, we played maybe a little quieter, but um, that was fun. That you know, rare moments of vindication and. And uh, the other aspect of those recordings was that Charles Dutrois never knew when to stop. So he would push and push and push and push the sessions. I forget, I'd have to look in my schedules how long they were, but they would be all-day sessions. And if we had four hours, he would go right to the end, like just over and over and over. There was never a question of, are you guys maybe tired? Maybe we should let this go. (laughs) <laughs> nothing remotely like that except w- there was one time I don't remember the date but when we recorded Afternoon of a Fawn um, we actually had finished all the big pieces that day and so Dutrois threw that on at the end and there was on- I think I've got this right there's only time to record it and that's maybe the only time I've seen him totally let go because we could have recorded it another day if, but it was just a, somehow we had this tiny block of time open up and that, that was extraordinarily rare. And he just let go and conducted like an, like a performer. 
and I think that's a beautiful recording. Many of them are beautiful, despite the uh, the blood, sweat, and tears part of it. But um, that was an inspired one, I thought. So yeah, everyone has a different experience. And the other thing I remember was that London Decca would set up these big, long tables for these all-day sessions. And I guess it's the time period that we were recording in. And there was not food there. There were just thousands of cookies. <laughs> Which I, I, you know, I tried eating them the first time. And it just, that combined with the yelling conductor and the, and the yeah, no, it's not good. <laughs> you learn to bring your own lunch after <laughs> So you have a very multidimensional career, and I'd love to get into some of your uh, specific projects individually. But, um, you know, when you look at your body of work, there's such an extensive uh, collection of recordings and your collaborations with Bassoon and Trumpet and Bassoon Out Loud. And um, you're one of the few in our field who is known as a bassoon soloist. And... I think, you know, that's um, in large part because of, you know, all these uh, efforts that you undergo Mm -hmm. to have our instrument be viewed in maybe a way outside of the tradition. Uh, So can you talk maybe about uh, why these creative projects and forging a identity as a solo instrument for the bassoon has been uh, important and how you've gone about forging that path? Yes, I love your questions because it's as if you're seeing more clearly than I can myself the course that my life has taken. Um, When I was at the beginning of my career, I was so interested in that music, but there was such a hierarchical, is that how you pronounce it, um, structure. So when you say traditional, I'm always skeptical of tradition because I think the only, um, I'm not, not skeptical of you using the word, I'm In the classical world, we use that word a lot. Mm -hmm. And very much from my earliest time, and maybe that's, yeah, I've never understood it. Because it seems to me that we can only, we're performers, we can only understand what has gone immediately before us. And if, particularly in Canada uh, and the U.S., we're in new countries, so what is tradition for us? It's it's what our teachers have told us. And, and, um... So I've never understood why, <laughs> I'm, I'm rambling, but it'll make a point after a while. When I was starting in university and doing my first orchestra concert, they they told us what we had to wear, and I was appalled. I'd come just off the ranch where we all wore jeans and we, we dressed properly for events, but when we got the list of what the orchestra was supposed to wear, the men could wear suits, the women had to wear long black skirts and blouses, I thought, where the heck am I going to get that? And why would I wear that? That's just ugly. And um, so I went and bought a long, dark blue dress. It was very dark blue, but I thought, and it was beautiful. I'm not, and it wasn't expensive. It, I just found it in somewhere. And even at the beginning, it, I didn't understand why we had to look that way, that depressed kind of way that they were describing in the, in the memo. So, um, I think that also I was very curious about solo repertoire, but in in the same vein as what is traditionally expected, I think tradition becomes the things that are articulated in your cultural environment. And therefore, people really begin to grow when they start to travel. I, they could grow before then if they do what you are doing, which is reaching out to the world. That's the same as traveling. If you actually put your arms out and and say, come to me and tell me what you know, that's a a form of traveling. And so when I was young, I I was very, well, first of all, I was hearing recordings for the first time because we were off the grid at the ranch. I did have one recording. I had um, right of spring was Zell, Cleveland and Oh, sorry, no, it was Boulez was conducting in Cleveland. It's an unusual recording. And we did have a generator and a record player at home, but my dad, it was the wrong kind of generator. He tested it, and he plugged the toaster in, and it caught fire. So we decided not to plug the record player in. So I'd only listen when I went to town. But um, 
just hearing what the bassoon could do in that, or like I, I could listen to that record when I was at school. I could hear the flexibility and the vocal quality of the bassoon, and I thought, well, why does it have to have a limited role? That just means people haven't, you know, I was really in a remote place, something that maybe most people can't imagine. But when you hear the voice, you can hear the possibilities. And that principle has remained with me forever. Like, um, so, so even today, the, the idea of a traditional role for the bassoon, I know it's a real thing, but I also know that if we accepted that, then we would just be accepting the experience of the people right around us as opposed to broader traditions or traditions that see the instrument as an extension of the voice. Although I think it's actually way more than that. The, the possibilities that lie within it have only begun to be tapped. And when I was first in the orchestra, because of the training and because of the lack of examples of other players playing as soloists, I was afraid to take the stage until I was absolutely a thousand percent confident <clears throat> of the repertoire. So I did my first concerto when I was graduating from Curtis and I got to, that was the Mozart and I got to play the Mozart a couple of times in Montreal. <laughs> but there's so much more repertoire than that. And, um, and the reality dawned on me that unless you start at the beginning of your career developing that repertoire and probably writing your own material as well and improvising, then it just takes longer to gain the confidence. That's all. It's never too late. But um, if I were to say anything based on my experience, I would probably say that my fear about stepping out as a soloist was in direct proportion with my awareness of how wonderful it could be. And at that point, you can seek out, like if you're afraid of something, it's probably deeply interesting to you in, the, in, the, in this context of of art. Um, therefore, I would, I actually found this always in my career at that stage, I would go to other players. So, not as a soloist, but as like uh, trying to become a better bassoonist, I would go to our principal oboe player, or I'd go to a violinist, and I would play my stuff and get feedback. So I'd say the same thing for people who are interested in developing the solo repertoire. I would say go to anybody. But I guess, I don't know, you're young, you guys. I don't know if it's the same thing now, but when I was younger, we were divided into camps. So if you showed interest in solo repertoire. That was probably the definition of hubris, and it, it was it was seen as a choice. Like, you could either be a de delusional soloist, or you could be an orchestral player who had a hope of making a living. And showing an interest as a soloist made it less likely that you would be accepted as an orchestral player. Has that changed? I hope it has. I suspect it hasn't, actually. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's not an issue. Um, I think it's changed in the names of the categories. Okay. But but I I think at, at least my experience is kind of uh, academic track versus yeah. orchestral mm -hmm. track is what I experienced yeah. a lot in school. Right. That's yeah. That's the thing that we don't have in Canada. There are no teaching positions, so there are no academic tracks. So <laughs> maybe my my worldview is simpler. So I would just say that that even though the counsel towards young players is often to choose your career path so that you have a hope of succeeding, you know, because there's so much involved. I actually think there's tremendous overlap and that becoming an, a superb soloist will make you a better accompanist. I, I know this from playing with pianists who are um, tremendous soloists. These are the most wonderful sonata partners. Obviously, not all of them are going to be like that, but in my experience, those are the people I want to go on stage with to play sonatas is somebody who can also go out and play a Brahms concerto. Um, and I think that overlap exists for bassoon players too. If you can, if you can lead an orchestra to accompany you in, in a complex modern concerto or a, a, a really agile Vivaldi, then you're going to be a much better orchestral player when you're sitting behind other soloists. So in my particular case, I think that the training as an orchestral player, well, it feels so essential. It, gives, it tells us everything about tuning, about rhythm, structure, 
but I actually needed to be heard as well. And I don't know if that's individual. It just feels so healthy that I, I would actually recommend it to everybody um, to have that experience and to take it to the highest level. And so in my world, it I followed my interest and and gradually uh, was able to uh, find situations that allowed me to pursue that interest. Because if, if you're... When I was deeply in the orchestral world, it, it caused strife when I performed as a soloist, um, particularly as a second bassoonist. I was told early in my career that second bassoon players don't play concertos. And my the thought balloon over my head was huge, and there was just a gigantic question mark in it. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> and it um, turned out that second bassoon players do play concertos. It's just with somebody's point of view uh, that somebody happened to be you know, a, a close colleague, but that was just an opinion, and and you don't have to agree with everyone's opinions. Um, and then also figuring out how to develop the resources and to pay for an orchestra and to pay for recordings, that's huge. And also how to get opportunities if you're out there. The paradox for, for orchestral bassoonists is if you're in an orchestra, they will possibly program a concerto once every 10 years, maybe a bit more if you're in a good situation. If you're, in, But you will not be considered a soloist. And if you're outside of an orchestra, it's hard to get those opportunities because they have bassoon players in their orchestras. And that's, that's kind of like, uh, you know, status of women. It's, it's all those kinds of areas that are part of a traditional way of thinking that can evolve over time. So the whole idea of a bassoon soloist is something that has to evolve and become part of our cultural landscape. So it'll be very different, you know, 100 years from now. I think we'll still exist, classical musicians, but I think all the things that are considered traditional will evolve. Yeah, my evolution was following what was interesting to me and finding ways to make the structure work. And what I gained from it is, I would just entreat everyone to examine those things sooner. Not because you have to be young to learn your repertoire, but the more experience you have, then the more evolved you can become. You know, performing from memory is essential, but you need that training. And it's largely self-training. Um, anyway, so even if your environment doesn't support it, it will bring you strength and flexibility to be a soloist, even if you're a career uh, professor or a career chamber musician or a career orchestral player. I mean, I don't really see why we have to cut out any of those things. You do a lot of um, different kinds of art within your music. You are a visual artist. Mm Mm-hmm. You record CDs, and you also give really interesting and innovative um, live performances and concerto performances, and you collaborate with poets and popular musicians and storytellers, and it seems to come from a very authentic, creative, expressive place. I wonder if you could talk about um, what that looks like and what inspired you to start performing concerts this way. Oh, thank you for positing it that way. Like, um, uh, that you, how you describe it is it's exactly how I would wish to see it. it. When I'm in the middle of it, it's messier because <laughs> it's, it's, I, I'm, it's, I'm besieged with, um, kind of a time, a deadline driven anxiety. Like all of these people that I meet, these extraordinary people, I want to collaborate with many of them. And then to figure out how the heck to do it and to find the money to do it and even to schedule people. <laughs> that concert with the poet in the event of true happiness, that concert, because I also um, did the Toronto premiere of one of my concertos for that show, that concert just about broke me. I'm still paying it off. It's like, <laughs> oh, my God. It, the we had so many people in the small concert hall and we outnumbered the audience. So, and yet I'm very glad we did it. So anyway, it comes from a, a really kind of restless urge and, you know, creativity is a great thing, but it's a propelling force and it has to be controlled. My bookkeeper 
just stands there aghast as I, <laughs> I she, said, she said, why? She said, shouldn't you be making money instead of putting it out all the time? And yeah, yeah. But you know what I think, of, like Brad Pitt's, like all these guys are executive producers, the difference is that they've amassed a, a fortune that allows it. Um, the, it's a powerful urge to make things happen. And I think there's something else behind it, like a, a less empathetic soul also once asked me, why do you do so many things? He said, you could probably make more money if you just concentrated on yourself. And I thought, but why would I do that? Because if you show, if I show what is marginally possible, like you throw a, um, a multimedia event together with different people, it's going to be raw because we don't have the budget to actually rehearse. Um on that particular concert, we also recorded the concerto the night before for six hours from 6 p.m. to midnight. And I just haven't had time to edit it yet, but that was our rehearsal. We did not rehearse. We went straight to recording with the group. And so I kind of saved money by not rehearsing at all, just recording. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But I'm hoping, my selfish, bizarre hope is that it'll it'll trigger some responses that will last outside of my sphere. So, um, and then once people will see what I can manifest, then I'm hoping they can imagine something better or more intricate or more amazing and that it'll actually create a culture. Like if I'm to put words to it, it sounds like a, a, a plan, but it's not a plan. I just, I just hope that I can create a place for myself by seeing for, if I can show people how, the art and the voice of the bassoon fits with so many things. And obviously I think that's a metaphor for any other instrumentalist. I, the bassoon is demonstrably subtle or supple and um, it accommodates different uh, settings so well just because, <laughs> I don't know, the, the voice is soft but it's, has, it's multifaceted. But I think it boils down to uh, allowing room for all the different kinds of performers. Maybe it boils down to me trying to create a culture where I can exist, and I might not live long enough to reap the benefits, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Shifting gears just a little bit, um, one of the many things that I think makes you a standout performer in and that I particularly admire is your facility of technique and your astonishing technical abilities. I remember um, the first time I heard your recording of the Tonsman Sonatine okay. and just I didn't know it could be played that fast. Like I, I remember it was just the first time I'd heard a woman bassoonist just throw mm. down and I just was so like inspired by it. Yeah, it was it was awesome, but um, you. you talked a little bit about um, with Bernard Garfield uh, kind of pulling out technical exercises or whatnot, but I wonder if you could kind of give us some hints or talk about your approach to um, technical passage work and that type of thing. Thank you. Um, and just let me say again, I'm really grateful for your generosity in looking at what I've attempted to do and seeing it as I meant it. That's um, very heartwarming for me and incredibly important. Um, at this very moment, my tiny computer is sitting on this massive volume of the draft copy of my chromatics that I've developed. And the book is called Solitary Refinement, the Chromatic uh, Installment. And it starts with one of Bernard Garfield's exercises, but it goes on to mine. And in terms of technique, there's a couple of things. There's temperament, and I'm a impetuous person who drinks too much coffee so it it's a, it's a real release but there's something about um well you guys know uh there's something about uh throwing yourself at the edge of something the, the just the sense of possibility and it's not about sheer speed it's about um it's actually about soaring and, and in different contexts it takes on different personas like sometimes you actually in order for for a piece of music to lift off the ground and not feel hurried, it has to be very fast. I don't know what how to say that in English or any other language, but there's this um, the possibility of being born aloft 
you, you have to experiment with different speeds and you have to also understand in yourself, like I'm speaking about myself, if I try to play fast the same way I play slow, it's not going to work. So I have to have an understanding of what it means to play with velocity. The principle, uh, like one of the primary pedagogical principles is you start, for bassoon players, start slow and incrementally expand your speed. And until you've mastered the slow thing, you can't master the quick thing. I actually disagree because I've worked with enough virtuosic pianists. And if we cannot achieve what we're trying to in terms of musical flow, one of them, he said, let's play it uh, 30% quicker than our final tempo. Just to shake off some of these, um, oh, sometimes you get you're hung up on precepts and ideas that interfere with the flow of the music. So we do that. And of course, it's terrible. But then when you return to the slow speed, you aren't as blocked. I know it takes away any heaviness that sometimes comes into slow playing. I'm not sure you should publish any of that because it sounds insane. Um, but <laughs> they, <laughs> in terms of technique, um, I actually love. I don't see technique as different from musicality. I just see it as the physicality of playing. So I, I love the physicality of the vibration of the bassoon. So I really, the act of playing um, is almost essential to my well-being. And I like how it vibrates on my fingers. I like how the instrument vibrates throughout the length. And I like how it reverberates in the room. That's why, partly why I live in a church, <laughs> a former church, because it's like living in a concert hall. And, I mean, that's, that's just pure luck, but that is what I love about it. So with technique, then you get to understand your fingers individually and how they're connected with the air and the embouchure. So what I got from Bernard Garfield was that any technical routine will be covered, any like any kind of motivic, concept that you develop should be taken throughout the entire range of the instrument and from that experience you get uh, you develop the structure of your embouchure and and by extension understand your reads better and it's fundamentally a way to measure the available distance on the bassoon if you don't do the technical routine through the whole range of the instrument then you're only measuring a segment of the bassoon and the other thing that I got from Mr. Garfield is that the high register is not hard. It's just we don't do it. The fingering, like it's, it actually responds more easily than the other ranges. Um, the fingering combinations are, are less familiar. I don't even know if they're harder. I think they are a little bit, but they're just less familiar. So that if we spend time there, we, we become fluent there. And so it's almost like it gives you the promise of of language to to do the technical materials and then my the what i was referring to earlier my my gigantic volume on chromatics called sol well all my technical work is called solitary refinement because i think it's funny but um this particular set of exercises i developed based on one of my recent commissions uh, the silver angel concerto was so hard and it, the range was so high like it, I think it goes to high F sharp, which is not, you know, a high G, like the top of the treble clef, is easier than a high F sharp. And it was so extended in its technical demands that I actually felt I needed to rebuild my embouchure. So that's why I, and I, I, I had meant to be publishing this by spring, but I'm not there yet. Um, it'll be, be out soon, but uh, I think... If you can find ways to see the underlying technique, I mean, the under, yeah, underlying technique actually is theory. You know, I spoke earlier when I was young that I huh, was afraid of theory. And now that I'm playing with folk and jazz players, these people have such uh, profound fluency in, in harmonic understanding. So technique then takes on a different dimension. So when I'm developing my technique to work with them, it won't be based on chromatics. That gives me fluency to play my classical stuff and gives me virtuosity to ex to access my whole range. But when I'm working with the folk and jazz players, I need to access something else. And 
we can always find a way to build that structure into our technique. Um, and I think the bassoon, like I've just been showing it, whenever I do um, solo recitals, I try to find opportunities where I can take the bassoon into schools, or and it's just as much fun to work with senior players. But just showing them that playing the bassoon, I think, is a little bit like playing the piano. Like, there's what other instrument uses the thumb more, except keyboards? Am I missing something? Like, mm-hmm. and yeah, just to play simple uh, fingerings on the bassoon is is like a cluster of chords. So, I just think that there's something so improbable about the bassoon needing so much involvement of our thumbs, <laughs> and, and so technique gives us the hope of fluency. Uh, and I think most of us are somewhat compulsive in our our habits, so we might as well harness that and expand our horizons with that character flaw of obsessive compulsive things. But, but it really also does help the reads. Um, you know, I have, have students say, "Well, what do you do to have a high register read?" I don't do anything. I just practice my whole range, and then the read has to be able to function supplely and, and responsibly in that range. Does having a career that you build around your strengths and interests and passions insulate you somewhat from experiencing performance anxiety? Is that something that you've struggled with before and how does it affect um, your choices in your in your pursuits? What a great question. <laughs> um Oh, I, yeah. I actually want to almost write it down. These would be really good blog topics. Um, so performance anxiety is like any other aspect of, I, you know, speaking from my vantage point of, I guess I've done this for a really long time. I'm 58 and I started playing when I was 16. That's a long time. So the, the um, performance anxiety returns in different forms throughout my development. And and absolutely, uh, you, as a soloist, you, hmm, that's actually less frightening than, uh, opening, like, Brahms, violin, uh, like, all those nasty, difficult orchestral parts, I find more nerve wracking than being a soloist. In fact, when I'm faced with an incredibly delicate orchestral entrance, I just imagine myself standing at the front of the stage, with a microphone like that, I can play so softly, but the sound will still be heard. I have to feel that um, separation in order to be part of the whole. I don't. That's just my weird brain. But it, it, if there's one thing I could communicate to young players, is that performance anxiety goes away. It, it, it responds to practice, and by practice, I don't mean the solitary preparation alone. I mean the practice of appearing before audiences, the practice of visualizing your goals and the practice of repeating them until it becomes familiar, it's guaranteed to go away. And then, if you're like me, you'll find a new avenue that's completely terrifying and yet <laughs> completely seductive, and therefore you have to open that door. And, and the fear returns. So I used to have formulas like don't drink coffee or go off coffee before auditions. It's probably still a good idea. But after I toured with the folk and jazz people, I thought, oh, these guys do everything before performances, and it doesn't bother them. So presumably that's all in your head. But I'm not saying that people should be bad. I mean, for me, coffee is the most the most powerful stimulant that I've ever had, and I like it. But while it's true that I have more command of my physicality if I don't drink it, it's far more to do with uh, how eager I am to step out on that stage and be familiar with the concept of being there in a different format, like audition, performance, concerto, and having done it enough times, prepared for it enough. The performance anxiety is a really real thing. It's just, it says this is new and your whole being needs experience, but it goes away and it gets transformed into pure energy, I think. Uh, but it's never a blanket gone for everything, and it, I certainly don't think it's anything to be afraid of, but maybe that's a very self-centered thing to say. In my experience, it's hit me hard. Like when I was the very first orchestra concert I did, we did Bolero, which of course I went on to tour and record in Montreal, and I was so nervous in that dump, uh, mm-hmm. alternating back and forth that 
what was happening was the fast reflex thing. I just, I would just sort of the shotgun thing would come out. And I had to really learn how to calm myself down to get through that. And then it returned when I, that reflex of fear returned when I first uh, recorded it with Montreal Symphony. And again, I had to find ways to to calm myself down. Once, in my case, it wasn't developing the speed. It was actually harnessing the reflex so that it wouldn't just come out erratically. So it goes away. And I had the confidence, even though I was shocked that it returned later in my career, like, between the age of 16 and 22, it came back when I was 22. I actually conquered it the second time, and I knew I could because I had already. And in my world, facing uh, situations that are frightening but clearly not threatening, like I don't go play my bassoon in a dangerous place, but I play it in unusual places, that that really takes away the fear. And also playing for people, uh, taking repertoire, like if I'm memorizing a concerto, Having the opportunity to stand in front of a group of children and play part of the concerto, or or go to a hospital and play it, again, that's something that Saul Schoenbach told me when I was young. He said, "Play it as as human music for people as many times as you can, and then when you get to the the main stage with the lights on and the paycheck waiting, then it's less terrifying." Mm. So, yeah, that's just good the, advice. Yeah, well, it works mostly, but it, people shouldn't be afraid of stage fright. Is all I'm trying to say. Nadina, this has been an amazing interview. Mm-hmm. When our listeners inevitably want to follow up with you, where can they find you on the Internet? Thank you for asking that, and I've enjoyed talking to you guys so much, too. So my website is nadinamackeyjackson.com or nadina.ca, and I think my Twitter handle is Nadina Mac Jack, and... I'm on Facebook. I have a band page and a personal page, and I'm very confused about that. So, and I think they're both under Nadina Mackie Jackson. And I think I'm on Instagram. I'm on a bunch of other things. It's all <laughs> on my website at nadinamackiejackson.com. And I love hearing from people if they take, if they want to write. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank this you. Been great. Thank you, Jackie and Gilly. Thanks so much. So we hope you enjoyed that interview. Be sure to follow us on all the social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Double Read Dish. You can also send us an email at DoubleReadDish at gmail.com. And you can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play, or SoundCloud. Thank you so much to our sponsors. And next episode, we have the pleasure of interviewing Andrew Parker from the University of Texas at Austin.